Good morning, afternoon, and evening, and welcome everyone to the final season episode of Global Insights, a live interactive weekly panel discussion which sheds light on big questions currently facing policymakers, planners, and researchers worldwide. Global Insights features experts from leading institutes of international affairs, including Konstanz University in Germany, Warwick University in the United Kingdom, the American University in Washington, the Institute for Strategic Affairs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and the Balsili School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada. Today's live streamed uh, episode is entitled COVID-19 and the Future of International Order. My name is Anne Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Balsili School, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's session. Warm welcome to all of the participants in the audience. We have many of you today. We would um, invite you to direct any questions you have, uh, particularly towards the end of the session, through the Q&A function on the Zoom panel, and we will do our best to channel those questions to the appropriate panelists. We're privileged today to have uh, five well-known experts on issues related to international politics, democracy, and global governance. Rensch Dorensvleit is an associate professor at the Department of Politics and International Studies at Warwick University. She has published on concepts of democracy, political institutions in divided societies, types of political systems, and waves of regime transitions. Miles Kaller was Rohr Professor of Pacific International Relations and Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the University of California, San Diego, prior to joining the faculty at the American University. He has published widely in the fields of international politics and international political economy, including articles and books on global governance, international financial institutions, and Asia Pacific regionalism. Abdul Mohammed is a retired senior UN official who for the past eight years has served as chief of staff for the African Union High Level Implementation Panel working in support of His Excellency Tabo Mbeki in the promotion of peace and stability in the Horn of Africa region. Abdul is a regular commentator on issues relating to the Horn of Africa. Michael Saward is Professor of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick. Most of his teaching and research concerns the theory and practice of democracy. He is the author of The Representative Claim and two forthcoming volumes, Democratic Design, and making representations, claim, counterclaims, and the politics of acting for others. David Welch is a university research chair and professor of political science at the University of Waterloo in the Balsili School, where he teaches international relations and global governance with a focus on security issues. A warm welcome to all the panelists. Really delighted to have you all today for this final uh, timely uh, session. I want to start with a big question on the impact that the pandemic has had on the current rules-based international order post-World War II era. So Miles, how in your view has this system fared? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, overall, I think the effects of the pandemic so far on the current order have been pretty negative. What we've seen is a scramble among national governments, even in the EU, in confronting the pandemic. In contrast to the global financial crisis of 2008-09, most of the more influential governments, or many of them, are headed by nationalists and populists who prefer unilateral action and bilateral deals. As a result, some of the institutions that were influential earlier, such as the G20, uh, have been pretty ineffective during the pandemic. The WHO has been caught up in conflict between China and the US. The WTO was already fairly weakened by US actions prior to the pandemic. Other organizations which have not become footballs in the conflict between US and China, such as the IMF and the World Bank, have definitely performed better. But I think the general lesson we can draw is if major national governments do not see crisis as a cause for collective and cooperative response, and in general they have not, then the order will stagnate or decline. Thank you very much. Abdul Mohammed, um, talk to us about your view on the challenges facing multilateralism with a particular focus on how this impacts uh, the interests of the African continent. Uh, thank you, Anne. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the conventional wisdom in Africa is that the multilateral world order is currently in turmoil. In places, it's breaking apart. Other places, it's paralyzed with leading powers adopting transactional politics as their modus operandi. Uh, 
Uh, this has a far-reaching implication for peace and security and development in Africa. The process of breaking down started long before COVID-19, but accelerated during this period. And uh, the past 75 years, especially since the establishment of the United Nations, we have witnessed substantial gains which should be recognized and defended. However, today's crisis in multilateralism and the rise of transactional politics needed to be understood in the context of resurgence of great power competition so that they can be managed and transcended. Perhaps one of the way of conceptualizing the shift is the, is the ascendancy of transactional politics, meaning bargaining over power using resources, threats, and coercion, and deceit over rule-based institutional uh, politics. And uh, just uh, as a result, the conduct of politics has become more akin to running a business than to governing a polity for the common goods. Africa, a weak continent, has much to gain from multilateralism and especially from its stronger, more normative versions. Thank Thanks you. very much, Abdul. David Welsh, um, you're, you focus a lot in your research on China and the Asia-Pacific region. Is China taking advantage of COVID-19 uh, in order to refashion international order to its liking? Uh, no. And in saying that, I realize I'm in a minority position. That's not the common view. The common view is that China is. Uh, my strong view, looking closely at its activities, particularly in the region, is that it's been uh, playing defense rather than offense. Um, it would be correct to think that uh, China is always trying to improve its own position within the prevailing international order. But again, it helps to distinguish different kinds of international order. It's a, there are very different ways we could look at it. Uh, the liberal international order based on Bretton Woods institutions, uh, open trade, um, what John Rogge calls embedded liberalism, um, that's under threat because of the breakdown, especially of the, the WTO as a functional coordinating agency for international trade. The rules-based international order, principles of the rule of law, peaceful settlement of disputes, Russia is the only major threat to that these days. It isn't China. The American hegemonic order, that's in trouble because the United States has backed away. The United States is itself in turmoil. So depending on how you want to look at international order, I would say at worst, China is trying to improve its position, not really very effectively. But it's not trying to overthrow it. China has never articulated some grand vision of an alternative to any of those current orders that I've just mentioned. Thanks very much. Well, talking about order, traditionally, liberal democracies have been the champions of um, the rules-based international order. But can these democracies survive the pandemic? Michael Sauer, what are your views on this? It depends in part, of course, of when we exit the pandemic. Are, are we in the early phase of the pandemic or are we towards the end of it? And what are the, we, we recognize many of the challenges systems to be cold democratic have faced and how they may have responded or failed to respond effectively to that already. Um, where will we be in the middle of the northern winter? Where will we be this time next year? What further challenges and uh, further crises might have the pandemic have provoked? But I think the, the pandemic so far has really laid some stark challenges to all aspects of democratic practices and structures we're already experiencing what people call the democratic disengagement and disinfection, lower voting rates and so on around the world. But I think representation, which is representative democracy, which is closely linked to the idea of liberal democracy, representation faces all sorts of challenges. I mean, who does speak for whom with some legitimacy and some credibility and authenticity these days? And it seems to me, for example, that the pandemic has thrown up a real divide between, on the one hand, the fact of being elected and on the other hand, the inclination or the willingness to represent, genuinely to attempt to represent a collective. I'm, I'm thinking of Brazil, I'm thinking of the USA, but they're not the only examples that I think could be, um, could be looked at there. We also have um, a kind of multi-sided surge, it seems to me, in non-elective forms of representation, expressive forms of representation. Um, we think of the Black Lives Matter movement, but we think of also, just to finish off, um, places where national representation has not touched. Think of poorer parts of Brazilian cities, for example, where the absence of the Brazilian state in protecting citizens has been extremely evident. 
and citizens themselves have had to organize in a sense to self-represent. So representation at the core of liberal democracy is certainly facing some stark challenges. Thanks very much. Renchka, you, your research looks at different types of political systems. In your view, what types of political systems have been more effective at managing the epidemic? Um, oh, that's far too early to say, I think, uh, because some democratic regimes, uh, can you hear me? Eh? <laughs> some democratic regimes have performed really well, like South Korea and Taiwan, uh, while others have performed poorly, like Italy and the United States. But at the same time, among dictatorships, there are countries like Singapore and Iran who have performed really poorly, uh, while Singapore has performed really well. So there's no clear uh, general empirical pattern. So moreover, from past experiences, we know that big health crises, um, that then other factors are far more important, like whether people have trust in their governments and whether the level of uh, state capacity is high. And these factors seem to be far more important than the type of political system. So, and on top of that, um, we can also not ignore the power of popular perception. So uh, more, and more, more people might believe that authoritarian rule is needed to deal with um, uh, big problems, especially if China uh, seems to be able to control the virus while the United States does not. So in short, we cannot state that democracies, for example, have been more effective than dictatorships uh, or the other way around. But the risk is that popular support for strong leaders will increase um, uh, even further all around the world, also when this crisis is over. Thank you. David Welsh, let me push that question to you. Winners or losers as a result of COVID-19? Well, uh, that last point is interesting. It could go the other way. In the short term, I think the big winners are the countries that responded early, quickly, and strategically and managed to contain the virus. Those are generally speaking all liberal democracies. They're um, often ruled by women. Uh, they might be a little bit smaller countries, so they can they have a, a scale advantage in terms of mobilizing resources. Um, so I'm thinking of New Zealand, of course, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Iceland. These are all our you know poster children for effective management. So in the short term, the way they do business gets a big boost. In the long run, uh, some of them may be losers. Taiwan's success may come back to bite it if, for example, it provokes China, if, if it uh, results in Taiwan being more widely accepted as a full member of the international community. Big losers, United States for bungling its response. Uh, China is taking a big soft power hit for its lack of uh, transparency and lack of full disclosure. Um, UK, again, for responding late and then cavalierly to the problem. And I would say populist countries in general are fearing very badly with the virus. And so it's, it may be that in the long run, this, this is a body blow to populism as a concept. Abdul Mohammed, um, amidst the waning uh, US influence, the steady rise of China and a new era of competition between both, where does Africa fit in? Well, uh, to respond to that question, I think first we need to uh, take into account that for the past 20 years, Africa has been a dynamic continent. We have not been stagnant. Economically, we have been growing an average of 4 to 5 percent, even though since the uh, COVID, uh, uh, you know, since just lately, uh, I think we are going to enter a recession. Uh, uh, even though our growth has been notable, uh, the quality for our growth is questionable. Uh, this growth is partly a function of our trade investment relationship with China. Uh, politically, all things considered, Africa's governing structures are okay. They have been uh, addressing some of the key issues of governance, and it is work in progress. And uh, uh, most of African governments are now a product of some sort of an election, however problematic. So. Uh, we have now extensive experience in Africa in dealing both with multilateral institutions and also with countries like China and US. Therefore, theoretically, we are in a position in managing this tension between China and uh, the US. Africa, we know, is an arena of great power competition. Uh, China's involvement in Africa is predominantly economics, while US is primarily security. So to, we cannot afford to be passive, we cannot afford to be intimidated by US and China tension. So one of the first order of things that we need to do is in a, in a very responsible and competent manner, 
not only us, but in, co in coordination with others, is to really make a strategic assessment of global trends and then see how within that context identify our interest and start acting upon it both on a bilateral basis and also on a multilateral. In the great scheme of things, uh, we are weak, but Africa has a history of using a weak hand effectively, both through multilateral uh, institution and others. Uh, so uh, 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 the tension is there. Uh, we know uh, we, uh, we need to articulate our interest in the context of the emerging global order and then use not only bilateral but multilateral mechanisms to assert our interest. Thank you very much. Miles, will the future international influence of countries be affected, in your view, by uh, the performance of these countries during the pandemic? Uh, you've just got to take your, yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh, I'm not sure how heavily I would weight that, this factor among others, but I certainly would think that I would hope that the countries that have performed the best would be the most influential going forward because I would argue kind of echoing some of David's comments that it's middle powers, middle democratic powers with high social capital, which are often the strongest supporters of the multilateral order who have um, done the best in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic. And also those that have been led by women, uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, Norway, Germany. Germany is led by a woman and a scientist. You can't beat that combination. So these are all very strong supporters of the international order. On the other hand, and here, once again, echoing David, strongman governments, whether they're democratic, populist, or authoritarian, have really performed very poorly. Um, Brazil, worst of all, perhaps. United States, Russia under Putin, and even China in the early stages of the pandemic. India's very badly managed lockdown under Modi. So there's an unwillingness in these strongman regimes to defer to experts have a contempt for expert knowledge and unwillingness to appear admitting defeat by the virus that has led to a very bad outcome. And these are exactly the regimes that have been most disruptive, I would argue, of the international order. So one can hope that those who perform well uh, will do well going forward in terms of their international influence. They are going to be the major supporters, I think, of the international order. Well, we've seen, generally speaking, a rise in a liberalism and a reaffirmation of state sovereignty since 2016. So uh, let me put the question to Abdul Muhammad. Abdul, is the future a liberal? Uh, uh, difficult to say, uh, but I am of a very strong opinion. The countries that have fared better in managing the coronavirus are countries with a very strong uh, people-oriented uh, history of a state, a state where public goods are given privileges, and the countries that have fared better have very extensive uh, public health systems, and the countries, no matter how rich they are, but who have a very neoliberal uh, infrastructure or neoliberal uh, approach, have not fared better. That's one way of distinguishing. So the Scandinavian countries have done better, Germany done better, um, South Korea, it has a very strong state tradition, uh, better. Uh, U.S. Uh, and U.K. since uh, uh, the, the Reagan and Thatcher uh, uh, revolution, they have been dismantling the state. They have been dismantling the state, privileging the private sector, privileging the market, deregulating markets at the expense of public goods. And so they have not fared better. So those countries that have a strong tradition of a state, a capable state, a set that delivers public goods should reorganize themselves and really play a very important role in the restructuring of the global order. Well, let, let's just extend on that. Miles, I want to go to you and ask you about your views on uh, domestic politics and how we're seeing domestic policies playing out and how they might impact on the future global order. Well, I, as I already mentioned, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with the idea that the pandemic is going to accelerate the trend toward illiberalism, because many of those illiberal leaders have not performed particularly well. But I think there certainly has been polarization uh, that is continuing. You can see it in the United States in the response to the pandemic. One of the reasons we have a continuing spread is a certain resistance on the part of part of, part of the population to measures that would uh, arrest the spread of the virus. Um, 
there's also the issue of the economic effects of the pandemic. Uh, most pandemics in the past have resulted in more inequality and that has uh, difficult to predict political effects. Um, so I think with regard to sovereignty and the attitudes toward global governance, it seems the initial strambles could be interpreted that sovereignty is going to be much more emphasized going forward, higher borders, fewer immigrants, less connection to a less threatening world. But you could also see an argument being made that we've made mistakes, we need more collaboration to prevent future pandemics and to re reduce the worst social and economic effects from this one. So it's a, it's a question of how, that's how that interpretation is going to play out politically going forward. But I don't think it's it's obviously illiberalism that will win, but I do think there's a possibility for more polarization and that could lead to uh, difficult problems in terms of global governance going forward. David Welsh, you, will we be seeing an uptick in cooperation or perhaps an uptick in conflict? I think Miles is right that it'll be a mixed bag. We're going to need an uptick in cooperation on things like global health management. Uh, that's Viruses just don't know borders. So that's going to be a, a necessity. I think we're going to see countries pulling back their supply chains and, and bring, bring vital supply chains back home. I think that will result in some reduction in trade cooperation. I think there'll be some temptation for countries to do go it alone policies, especially if they're doing well vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. So I would expect some degree of declining cooperation. Outright military conflict, of course, that's likely to be triggered by other considerations, not by the pandemic. But of course, one, one never hopes that that will happen, but one can never write it off as a possibility. Thank you. Rensk, uh, Dornsplit, can you talk to us about individual human rights and freedoms and uh, trends moving forward post-pandemic? Yeah, well, I think Miles is correct that uh, illiberalism will not win. I hope at least that he's uh, correct. But the problem is that there are li liberal democracy was already in decline before the pandemic started. And it is to be expected, of course, that dictatorships have used this crisis to uh, decrease civil liberties. So it's not su surprising that the Chinese government has detained uh, journalists who reported on the outbreak. It's not surprising that the government in Thailand, for example, has threatened um, journalists who are critical of the policies around the crisis. It's not surprising in general that authoritarian uh, regimes have censored information and used intimidation. Um, with, for example, lawsuits uh, to silence the opposition, etc. That's to be expected. What, what is more worrying, though, is that there are also illiberal uh, trends within uh, the established li liberal democracies. So new uh, surveillance uh, technologies have been used everywhere, and uh, democratic governments are using smartphone location data to track down uh, citizens who may have been exposed to, to the virus. And this is not necessarily anti-democratic, but it is a risk. So, um, um, because of course, political abuse of those uh, measures is likely, and people will also get used to this, those new measures by their, uh, um, so they will get used to control, not just uh, via surveillance, but also, for example, uh, via the banishing of protests, etc. So yes, I think the ep epidemic could also lead to a reduction of individual rights and freedoms after the peak of the crisis, which is more worrying. And how those um, rights can be protected, that's something to keep a close eye on, I think. Because when the new measures are implemented, which weaken the civil liberties, then uh, transparency and oversight, checks and balances are uh, more important than ever. Thank you. Michael, um, you do a lot of work on the concept of democracy. So give us your views on um, uh, how, if at all, uh, the defining features of that concept might change going forward, um, or the interpretations of the defining features may be debated and contested slightly differently moving forward. I think it's a fascinating question, and then there's there's much on the table there. The, the idea of illiberal democracy, and indeed liberal democracy, neither of those comes in one form, of course, contemporarily or or historically. But but speaking in general terms, it does seem to me that there is an opening around um, two areas of, that we normally associate with liberal democracy, um, maybe to make it less liberal and more social in some ways. Now, what I've got in mind there is that social democracy is a rather old fashioned phrase now. Social Democrats tend to be rather outflanked on the right um, and on the left, uh, certainly across Western liberal democracies and other countries. But the idea of burden sharing, the idea of greater social equality, health equality, educational equality, 
We've seen how a number of um, minority ethnic groups, for example, in different liberal democracies have um, been hit particularly hard in, in health terms and in terms of unemployment, and we'll have to see how this unfolds. Um, so the idea of a more collective burden sharing, and I, I dare to call it some form of social democracy, as a kind of modifier, as a kind of diluter, as a kind of historical cousin of what we think of as liberal democracy, I think there's an interesting potential opening there. Whether, given all the pressures that other people have talked about on different types of democracy around the world and how well they've coped with the pandemic or not, whether that's an opening that will be taken up, we wait and see. I think another one that's really interesting is an idea very closely associated with liberal democracy um, historically, the idea of protective democracy, that states are there to protect the rights of individuals, of a highly individualist conception of a political order. But of course, the word protection takes on a whole new set of meanings in the context of the pandemic. And um, of course, the state was always a Hobbesian state. It always had that power to step in and change and run our lives as much as a Lockean state, protecting our rights to property and so on. But there's an opening there too about um, legitimate, put it this way, legitimate and democratic new forms of a more encompassing idea of protection. So it's clearly to do with uh, healthcare, social care systems, uh, and so on. I think I would just add to that. It seems to me that some aspects, some, some aspects that we haven't always thought of as particularly troubling about our liberal democracies have looked as if they're becoming more troubling at the moment, not least because of the pandemic. One of them is just the machinery of elections. How, how do you run elections? How do you keep the distancing? We, now we saw a good example, probably a good example, in South Korea, who did run a national election uh, relatively early on when the pandemic um, uh, hit. So, so perhaps South Korea has lessened, but in terms of formal and informal gerrymandering, suppression of votes, different health risks for different communities actually getting to a poll, whether uh, mail-in votes are to be allowed uh, and accepted. It's the machinery of democracy, the actual conduct, um, has new questions posed against it, uh, it, it seems to me. And um, I think one other that I would mention there is democratic leadership. I mean, for some people, this is a contradiction in terms, democratic leadership, but clearly it's not. Um, not much attention has been paid to the concept and the practice of something called democratic leadership for some time, but clearly it's coming into the center of debates more. Various colleagues on the panel have discussed examples of very poor leadership, and um, although we're still in the middle of all this, uh, what look like very strong examples of good, effective uh, leadership. So what are the components of democratic leadership uh, moving on from here? I don't know the answer to that, but I think the question has risen up the agenda. Thank you very much. David Welsh, is the sun setting on the rules-based international order? What should, in your view, the defenders of uh, the liberal international order or the rules-based order be doing at the moment? I don't think the sun's setting. I think everybody appreciates the value of uh, predictable, stable international order. So the rules are important and everybody knows that. Um, people would like to adjust rules sometimes, but there are ways to do that peacefully and uh, organically. So I don't worry in the long term about order as such. I do worry about sort of a balkanization of global politics and a breakdown in the channels of cooperation that will just make us all worse off and, and make the planet worse off, for example, by interfering with our fight against climate change. But I'd like to see the real champions of the rules-based international order and the liberal international order do is, is get together uh, in a very self-selected, voluntaristic way and start doing more things together. And I'm thinking of countries like Finland, Nor Norway, Iceland, Germany, France, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea. This is an excellent self-selected group to be thinking about real policy options for boosting international cooperation and strengthening um, the rule of law globally. The CPTPP is almost a natural uh, existing structure for promoting um, and defending liberal trade insofar as possible. I would bring Taiwan into that. I would demonstrate to the rest of the world the value of this kind of multilateralism by just enhancing economic cooperation through that vehicle. So we can, we can do some things together that are that are proactive and voluntaristic, and some things that we can demonstrate through 
accomplishment. I don't think we should feel compelled to add the traditional big countries into the mix. They're, they're a problem, they're not a solution. So the United States isn't going to be helpful, don't invite it. If China's not gonna be helpful, don't invite it. Go it alone. In that context, some of those countries that you've just mentioned have already come together uh, in a new form of multilateral alliance or coalition. Any, any hopes with the prospect of, of what this coalition can do? With creative leadership, all, lots of things are possible. And uh, you know, a lot of countries are lacking creative leadership right now. But the ones I just mentioned, for the most part, are doing pretty well from a leadership perspective. Great. Michael Sauer, can I come back to you on the concept of democracy? Where are the avenues to have this discussion in the future on uh, avenues of reformed future democracy? Whatever the new normal democracy is going to be, uh, we can't be clear, but it can't be the same as it is now. I, mean, I think various comments that people have made give the sense that um, the challenges that democratic systems and even the very idea of democracy have been facing around the world have just been exacerbated and, and some of them really brought clearly into the into a glaring light as a result of um, the attempts to navigate or the failures to navigate uh, the challenges of the pandemic um, and there was a lot of thinking going on before all of this about how do we make democracy more deliberative how do you bring the citizens more into the process now this is mostly western thinking but by no means only a lot of the innovations around deliberation and uh, uh, decentralization come out of Brazil and other Latin American countries over the last uh, 10 to 20 years. The OECD and the American Academy of Social Sciences have published reports just in the last um, month or two, detailing you know, what new democracy might, uh, might look like. And uh, again, I think certain um, things have come back up the, the agenda there. I mean, the, 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 if you ask democratic theorists, no, who'd want to ask them anything? But if you ask democratic theorists, their answer to be how, how to fix democracy, how to improve democracy, make it more authentic and engaging over the last 20 years would be more deliberation. Citizens assemblies, decentralize the local government, get citizens involved directly, co-consultation with citizens and, and so on, forms of deliberation. But how do you deliberate when you have to be two meters from each other or have, you have to do it remotely, you have to do it virtually. So interesting that the stock answer of the last 20 years about the main direction in which the quality of democracy can be improved now looks particularly problematic. And again, some of the responses that I think come out of action and inaction indeed over the pandemic, um, decentralization. I mean, if we look at federalism and the way aspects of federalism have been enacted and enlivened and, and made to work either by direction or by misdirection. If we look at federalism in the US and where the states and sometimes localities have stepped in. If we look at the new innovation in Australia, which um, as has been suggested has navigated this fairly effectively, so it seems. Um, the idea of a national cabinet, bringing together national government and the individual state governments within a federal system. If you look at local city responses in a number of countries around the world, organizing for themselves. So I think the very idea of power genuinely, not just symbolically, but genuinely being decentralized, creating multiple, multiple polities effectively within one, um, is certainly one direction that has not been there um, in terms of democratic form, but I think it will be. Can I mention one more quickly? Emergency yeah. powers. Now, now Renska mentioned this, I think a, a, a moment ago, that one of the dangers to well, to all sorts of things, but to liberal democracy is that um, powers to do things that governments are granting to themselves at the moment may not disappear. There may be a new tidewater mark, as it were, for state intervention into the lives of individuals, businesses, uh, and so on. So the very idea of emergency powers, which we don't hear much about, but, but maybe this needs to be debated openly. If you're going to have a liberal democratic system, to what extent over what time frame, with what justification and what accountability are something like emergency powers going to be tolerable, legitimate, acceptable? Thank you. Wrench, over to you. What are the main important challenges to democracy that require further debate? Oh dear, well Mike already mentioned a lot, so I will not repeat them, uh, but there's one uh, missing uh, piece, I think, because uh, it's not just about citizens. I think we tend to forget about the children and they are the future, um, but they are not well re represented uh, well in our current political systems. And the problem is that we do not talk about them much, but let alone talk with them. And it's quite remarkable as the pandemic is having devastating consequences for children and their rights. 
So the pandemic has had, let, uh, has had a massive impact on their education with the school closures everywhere. Many uh, children are struggling with more poverty and children living in uh, difficult places like conflict zones and refugee camps. Uh, and overcrowded communities, etc. They they suffer most. So the international community or individual countries need to take measures to protect the children, their health and education and other rights. I think there are some really important um, initiatives by organizations like uh, Save the Children and World Vision. And an, another really important initiative, which is interesting, is uh, the one by Terdezon. Uh, this organization has released joint statements and open letters to European governments to ask for the protection uh, uh, of the rights of children. And they also, what's interesting, they also simply asked uh, children in surveys uh, all around the world. So not just in established democracies or in um, rich countries in Europe, it's everywhere. And it's quite interesting because they asked the children about their experiences during this crisis. So in my opinion, um, if you want to rethink uh, democracy, for example, it's not just about the citizens and about the liberation, et cetera, but I think we also need, and of course social, the social aspects uh, are all very important, but we also need to acknowledge that the, the insights that children have and let the children play a role, ensure their participation also in the context of a new uh, international uh, order. Thank you. Miles Keller, as societies look increasingly inwards, Post-pandemic, do you think there's going to be a transition outwards again and a re-engagement in international affairs? How hopeful are you? Um, I think one of the big risks, given we haven't talked a lot about the economic consequences of the pandemic, which are very, very grim. Uh, the IMF issued its World Economic Outlook update yesterday uh, in the morning, and uh, the predictions for all the major economies apart from China is that they will shrink substantially, which is unprecedented. China will grow by 1%, it's estimated, in 2020, which is also unprecedented for China. Um, so I think the economic consequences of this pandemic are very grave, and there will be a tendency to withdraw, to look inward. Um, and that could be as much of a threat to the international order as um, disruption, uh, active disruption by one country or another. Uh, withdrawal itself, uh, in fact, that's the characterization that Richard Haas has made of the Trump administration. It's the, the Trump doctrine is a doctrine of withdrawal, not disruption. But withdrawal itself can disrupt. I would say on the positive side, uh, and I'm echoing here Renska's comments, we've talked a lot about governments. We tend to get into a very state-centric view of international politics and order. But we should not ignore the fact that there are a host of influential non-governmental actors um, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, international corporations um, who are becoming somewhat more socially uh, aware uh, under a certain amount of pressure, foundations like the Gates Foundations. Uh, so governance and the international order is not just about states. And I think these actors, in fact, will play a major role in maintaining a certain level of engagement, a certain level of interest in what's going on globally, even when governments are under a lot of pressure economically to withdraw and pay attention only to their domestic affairs. Thank you. Abdul Mohammed, um, what does this mean for engagement or perhaps disengagement uh, with the African continent? Well, uh, Africa is a tailor made for multilateralism because we are too small, too fragmented to make sense, not only globally, but also even to ourselves. So from the beginning, what we inherited from colonialism were fragmented political scene for fragmented countries. So from the beginning, our African uh, founding fathers, uh, their obsession was on how to overcome this uh, fragmentation. And that's why the African Union was established. And as a result of that, in Africa, major strategic decisions of global implications are taken collectively. And, and even within this pandemic uh, period, I think the Africans responded without any major coercion from outside collectively, either at the sub-regional level or at the continental level. And, um, and that was very difficult to, 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 to achieve in the West. Uh, but in Africa, it was, you know, and even one of the things that surprised me, and I want to mention this because nobody, uh, nobody uh, kind of flagged it, is I was astonished and shocked by how anti-scientist some of these big, big countries are. US, one of the most highly educated, you know, uh, society, etc. You know, uh, they don't listen to scientists. They don't appreciate uh, 
in this kind in this uh, pandemic uh, you know environment to listen to experts and to the scientists and and in africa that was not a problem the, uh, you know the moment because we did have uh, a history of dealing with pandemics uh, you know relatively speaking more than others in recent uh, times uh, therefore uh, the african population by and large everything being relative uh, were not uh, were not hostile to responding collectively and were not hostile to assisting the state to cope and to respond to the challenges you know and and then uh, even in the context of the global order uh, because our history is a history of making sense and making ourselves important through multilateral effort uh, you know we are i think ready more than the others to contribute however limited in the uh, redefining what constitutes a global order that is fair that is uh, uh, you know democratic accessible participatory and also uh, redefining the content of this new uh, global order right now the global order is primarily defined by military by security consideration and predominantly by economic all right i think we can play an important role in having other public good contents to this uh, reorganized global order like climate change and its implication and public health global public health you know therefore the new global order should not reorganize itself based on current uh, current status quo or refiddling with it or uh, touching it here and there it has to reorganize itself by taking into account what constitutes a new global public order and uh, public goods thank you very good point um let's look at that order moving forward Rensk, give us your thoughts on what that might look like <laughs> well i don't i don't know um the only thing is uh, well i can say what's happening now so the main forces at the moment which are un undermining the international order i think is uh, economics politics so let's start with the economics i think it's really likely that the pandemic have will have a huge impact on economic factors so economic inequality will increase uh, as well as in unemployment, unemployment and poverty and there will be a huge pressure on financial institutions then secondly politics so those economic problems will also have an impact on politics um, because political systems of all types whether they are democracies or dictators, dictatorships will have to deal with them but studies have shown that there's a strong link between economic development and democracy so in other words uh, the pandemic is likely to have a negative impact on the economy which in turns have turn have a negative impact on uh, democratic politics uh, so I think therefore the rise of authoritarian politics is very likely all around the world and those factors like politics and economics uh, they can also have an effect of course on the international level with global uh, power shift from the west to the east although i agree with uh, david that it's not necessarily the case that um, china takes over um, but there will be a power shift so when thinking about the un unfolding crisis of the liberal um, uh, world order i think there are several scenarios i don't really like those um, because we can't really predict but well let's try so the first is more the pessimistic one with, with more authoritarian and politics everywhere and also with more support among uh, people for this um, type of politics with um, political rights and civil liberties being at risk but on the other hand you can also say the alternative scenario is that we know um, that this can happen and people know those risks and they will act and will make sure that it will not happen uh, in order to make a, a better world for themselves so yeah history in the end is not deterministic and the future is um, at least for some ex uh, to some extent i think in our own hands so thank you michael sauer your your views on the future my colleagues have already offered in some cases some attractive and compelling visions and some major cautions so i'm very briefly just going to say in the very short term and in the medium term two factors i think will be absolutely not decisive but very important to how this question may come to be answered first of all is the outcome of the election in the usa this november a second trump term will have a very um whatever it looks like and personally i hate to think but um um 
a, a Democrat victory this November is likely to lead to some attempt to revive U.S. attachment and support of a range of international institutions and a style of international cooperation, which will not take us back to some existing liberal world order or pre-existing, but some new version of something which is not withdrawal and, and which is not destructive. I think the slightly longer term, slight medium term factor is the survival and the prosperity and the international outlook of the European Union. The European Union in some ways is in trouble. It, it lacks democratic legitimacy. It, it lacks um, a, a hold on the imaginations of European citizens by and large. Its mechanisms are up to a point effective. Its overall um, uh, sense of legitimacy or capacity to generate legitimacy is, is weak. And I think um, a great deal is going to depend on that, but I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you. Abdul Mohammed, what does the future mean for political leadership? Uh, you're speaking from a country um, which hosts this year's Nobel Peace Prize winner. Uh, we're seeing um, an election that's been postponed, but upcoming. I mean, what are the central tenets of political leadership going forward in your view? Well, uh, I share uh, the views expressed by my colleagues. Uh, the absence of uh, global leadership is very glaring. Uh, you know, uh, these are exceptional and challenging times for a global order requiring exceptional leadership, and that's not there. Uh, the absence of leadership when uh, needed uh, during this pandemic time, perhaps with the exception of those countries that are led by women pri uh, prime ministers, the rest uh, actually did not perform uh, to the challenge. So. We need a new global order. We have talked about that. Uh, multilateralism that is suited to the contemporary order. And we need leadership that would make it possible for us, for, for that would make it possible to facilitate this. Uh, of immediate ne necessity uh, will be collective leadership of those countries that had previously been content to follow uh, the United States. Now they have to provide, they have come, they have to come together and start articulating uh, a new collective uh, global order. Uh, that leadership will need to address uh, the global challenges of overcoming gross inequality under the current status quo. Extreme inequalities between regions of the world are driving major threat to global stability, such as mass migration and violent extremism. Inequality within the country, everywhere, in Europe, America, inequality within, within each of the country are driving also discontent with existing political uh, order. So even these are even threats to democratic uh, countries. So you need leadership now that will take into account the pluses and the minuses, the strength and the weaknesses of the past order. And this leadership will not only come from, uh, from the traditional uh, uh, superpower countries, uh, the, the West, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know they, they should come from all over. I mean, there must be a vehicle in which leadership will emerge from all parts of the world. And you need to have a system that will capture that, that leadership for a collective, uh, you know. Therefore, I think for US and China, which are the subject of our, uh, you know, uh, discussion because their tension is driving this narrative to a certain extent. I mean, we should prevail on China that they should, uh, they should not uh, engage this new global order by having a very expansive definition of sovereignty. Okay, expansive definition of sovereignty. And for the US, uh, if Trump gets, uh, gets reelected, I think, uh, I think that, that's, that's a dire scenario. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, U.S. should be content that they cannot continue as the superpower, uh, you know, a, a mono, a, the, the monopolar world is coming to an end. And necessarily, this is not bad for them, you know. So, and at the same time, the Europeans who have a very good tradition, in spite of the difficulties that the EU is, uh, is uh, facing, uh, the Europeans should really re-articulate and reinvent themselves in a manner that will make it possible 
to facilitate this new cooperation. And Africa, as I said, is a multilateral, is a collective continent, and it will not be very difficult for us to make our modest contribution. Thank you very much. Um, David Welsh, quickly, any black swans that you feel are keeping you awake at night? Well, that's a great question. And here's one I never would have dreamed a few years ago I would even think of, and that is Trump loses the election in November, refuses to acknowledge the result. Uh, his very well-armed white nationalist supporters come out in defense of his staying in the White House, and you have a constitutional crisis and chaos in the streets of the United States. If the United States is out of business for an extended period of time, uh, the world's in a lot of trouble. So that's one. Another, of course, would be uh, humanitarian catastrophe and, and state collapse in North Korea, which goes badly in a number of directions. Another would be possible Chinese military action against Taiwan. And another would be a crackdown in Hong Kong that provokes uh, a very dramatic international response. So there's a lot of minds, minds out there to be stepped on. Thank you. Miles, any concerns um, from your base in Washington in light of David's comments? Um, well, I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I wouldn't argue that my Canadian friends to the north are a little alarmist, but I do think that is a little alarmist as a black swan. There, there are people who are concerned about that sort of an outcome from the election. I, I'm more concerned that we, we face an alternative of kind of stagnation um, and fragmentation in the global order going forward because of disengagement um, and, and maybe a deepening conflict between the United States and China. And that simply is not an acceptable outcome if we're going to deal with issues like climate. Remember, we do have these other issues beyond the pandemic, um, and, and those are not being dealt with at the moment, really. So uh, I, to me, that's the negative outcome, um, and that is certainly a realistic outcome. I hope it is not the case. I prefer one of reform and transformation, but that may not be not what we get. Thank you very much. There are more questions coming in on regionalism. And are these gains or losses for regionalism and regional level state cooperation? Abdul, I'm going to direct that question to you, if I may, um, uh, to give us a bit of an African context on that. Well, uh, please elaborate. Regionalism, in a sense, well, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing big questions asked at the moment about the EU, as one colleague uh, said, questions being asked about the UN, especially with their um, a response or lack thereof to the pandemic. Um, whether the regional organizations, you have many on the continent, do you think yeah. there's a future uh, for them? Is it brighter or is it darker? Uh, uh, well, it's work in progress, uh, but there is a, a good history in Africa of benefiting from regional organizations, uh, both at the continental level as well as also in the sub-regional level. And these institutions have been undergoing transformation uh, to make themselves relevant to the current challenges. Uh, and, and the African Union represents the continental view and the sub-regional organization represent the challenges within their sub-regions. They work in harmony. There are normative principles that they subscribe to that is being crafted at the, at the global, I mean, at the continental level. So we have the infrastructure for a robust regional institutions. We have a problem of managing them uh, in terms of their capacity and in terms of resources to manage them. Uh, but in terms of ideas, in terms of principles guiding, uh, we are doing okay. And uh, uh, and, and, and more than other continents, actually, with the exception of Europe, uh, regionalism, multilateralism is deeply rooted. One of the major challenges, for example, we Africans have with the Middle Eastern countries is they don't have a functional multilateral institutions. So they are transactional. You have to deal with them country by country. And, and, uh, and as a result of that, they are extremely prone to, uh, uh, to, uh, to transactions. Uh, so no principles guiding them. But uh, let me close with one thing, and that is the context. Uh, actually, my, my, I thought this, uh, this conversation uh, will, 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 uh, will spend a bit more time uh, on, on, on the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and what to do about it. You know, what our vision is for the UN uh, to go forward. I think, uh, uh, just give me, uh, just, one, let me point out one or two things. One is, with all of its minuses, the UN has really performed okay. It has avoided a third world war, all right? It is good, UN cannot guarantee peace 
but the UN can actually prevent you from going to war, you know? And they have done a number of, uh, uh, a number of uh, initiatives to that, to that end. And let me close by saying, as Doug Hammarskjöld, one of the consequential leaders of the UN and multilateralism said, the UN was not created to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. And that still remains true. Thank you very much. Um, can, I'm mindful that we have many policymakers in the audience. Um, can we just end with a bit of a 15 second burst on what you would encourage them to consider at the moment? To all the panelists, Michael, we'll start with you. I would say policies for policy. What is the machinery for making policy? How can democracy be revised to make it more participative, to generate a greater sense of legitimacy, to overcome the democratic disconnect with citizens? It's manifest itself differently in different countries and different regions. But policy itself is one thing. How you make it to generate legitimacy for it is another. So I would urge attention there. Thank you very much. Renske, tell us your oh, view. Oh dear, well, there are many on my list, but um, uh, be aware of illiberal trends within established democracies. They should worry us, uh, especially in the longer term. So make sure there's transparency and oversight, checks and balances. That's one, uh, what, well, I already said the other things. Um, uh, well, popular support for strong leaders will agree, uh, can, can increase, so accept that. Uh, don't be afraid of it, but protect the democratic rights and do not let them slip under their influence. Another one is to include children in the process, uh, let them be heard. Um, and, and one thing, we have not really mentioned uh, climate change. Uh, and I think, uh, well, we, uh, the future is unpredictable, but we can learn from the past. So other crises will happen. We don't know when, um, but it will happen. So what are the lessons to be learned from this crisis and to deal with the next? Um, so that's... Um, Thank you. Miles Collar, what would you say to the policy world? I would say to make the strongest case for reform and transformation of the global order to a much wider public than we have in the past. This has been an elite debate up to this point and should be much a part of a much wider public debate. And finally, uh, work very hard to control the narrative. I think the lessons we learn from this crisis are still very fluid. Uh, it could go either way toward more unilateralism and closure. Uh, or toward more cooperative steps to maintain an open international order. And that's a political process of controlling the narrative and making sure the last narrative is the one that is dominant in the future. Great point. David Welsh, key points for the policy world. Well, for the like-minded defenders of the liberal international order, what I said earlier, um, get together, brand yourself, do a G11 and start pushing good ideas and, and demonstrating the value of performance. And also bring Taiwan in from the cold. Great. Um, and finish us off, Abdul. What are your key recommendations for the policy world in 15 seconds? Not, 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 not much. You know, the other colleagues have identified some of the things I wanted to say, but attitude matters, uh, I think. And that attitude, number one, I think all of us should be humbled by what happened in this pandemic. I think this pandemic showed the big and the small countries their limitations in responding to, to the challenge like this. Therefore, you know, learn the proper lesson from this pandemic. And to learn the proper lesson, you have to be humble. So that's one, one important. And policymakers should also uh, uh, resist, uh, resist of arrogance. There are some countries that are uh, manufacturing arrogance through their established system. And this pandemic has shown that arrogance will not lead you very far. Therefore, as we contemplate a new global order, we need to be humble, we need to listen to, 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 to all, and we need to make sure that we learn from everybody. And also, uh, I think to echo what uh, another colleague said, we are now dealing with a very highly politicized population globally, especially the young. We should take them seriously and build the new global order with this new politicized population. I, as an African, has been extremely heartened for the kind of global outrage that has been exhibited by, especially by young people uh, in, uh, in support of Black Lives Matter. And these are the infrastructure of consciousness that we need to build the new global order.
Some wonderful summary comments there. I hope the policy world was listening as well as our scholars, planners, and everyone in the audience. Thank you very much to all the panelists for a wonderful final session of this particular COVID series of the Global Insights series. We will be returning in September with a more compelling series then, and we would invite you to tune in uh, and be with us at that time. I'd like to finish by thanking all of our institutional partners for bringing together such a, an incredible collection of panelists over the last eight weeks. You've been brilliant. Thank you to all of you. Stay safe, stay well, and stay united. Goodbye.